actually doing any fast testing where you are. No. Cool. Yay. Okay, this makes me very happy. Um, so, then I want to start off by why anyone should consider uh, what you get that, you know, why you should do chaos testing. Because the world is actually naturally chaotic. The, you should test to make sure that what you're actually building is going to withstand, you know, the, the chaos of everything going around and all the, the infrastructure and, you know, if you have a distributed system, these connections might go down. You want to make sure that you can handle what happens when, when this infrastructure goes down. Uh, systems should have a lot more variance. You guys heard about the, uh, the Volkswagen test failure. There was a, they were fudging their tests. They, they were making them up the results and giving false results for, I believe it was the, the environmental testing for their cars. And the way this was actually found is that the tests across the board were much too even. There wasn't enough variance in what the results were and how and you know what, what the results were given. And so the, there should have been more chaos. There should have been a, a lot more you know, variance in, in what these tests were. And so you know, the, generally, the world is much uh, very naturally chaotic. So do we need more testing? And there's a lot of testing that, that folks do already. There's random testing, there's angel testing, there's sanity testing, unit testing. You know, why, why do we need to add chaos testing to this mix? Or we've already tested all of our components. We've done a lot of different things. But, you know, have you tested what will happen if a connection goes down and, you know, the website loads without the CSS? This is a picture of what, you know, the jet.com website would look like without CSS. There's, if you tested this time out, have you tested your failover setups? Are you sure, positive, that all of these actually work as you expect them to? Now, you know, if you have something like that, it's not going to be a good experience. You know, in addition to testing, you know, like unit testing, if you tested all of your individual components, but if you tested how they interact in the environment, have you seen, you know, maybe there's two things that don't actually work together quite right, you know, quite correctly. Maybe this works perfectly fine, but when you introduce something new, Maybe it, it doesn't, you know, the, the, the products don't interact correctly. So there is there is additional testing that that, uh, that you need to make sure that, that the interactions in your environment are, are solid. Um, for the folks of you who were here yesterday, I spoke a little bit about who Jet is and, and the company. Uh, so I'll go a little faster on these slides, it's just two of them. But we are a startup. We're, uh, e-commerce startup, we want to be the new Amazon. Uh, we launched in July, we are US based, so we don't deliver out here, so I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, I spoke yesterday about the, the microservices we have, we've you know, about 700, we're the number four marketplace worldwide. Basically we have a lot of customers, a lot of data, a lot of uh, infrastructure that we need to be able to maintain a website that, that gets this level of traffic. Some of the technologies we use uh, were heavy, heavy users of Microsoft Azure, and I uh, often have gotten questions on why we chose Azure. In general, we are a, a .NET shop. We use a little bit of C Sharp, a lot of F Sharp, and so it was a natural fit to use Azure, but also since we like to see ourselves as competing with Amazon, we are not going to choose AWS. Uh, but, you know, we. Uh, like I mentioned, we're heavy users of F-Sharp, heavy users of Azure. We have some React Node and Angular on the front end. Uh, our Python, SAS, and PDW for our data science. And this bottom section here in green is sort of all of the other technologies we use. There is quite a bit of mix. Yeah. But what actually is chaos engineering? You know, again, and we've sort of covered that we, we need this additional level of testing, but, but what does that actually mean? And a lot of folks just think of it as, you know, wreaking havoc, breaking things, just for fun. And to go in and shut down services because you feel like it. And, you know, this is, <laughs> developers hear this, they think, you know, terrible, horrible thoughts, and why would you ever do this? This is, this is a terrifying 
terrifying scenario and not something that, you know, normal people would want. But chaos engineering is more controlled experiments. It's about, you know, very small levels of, of changing things, of testing things that will help you build confidence. You want to have, you know, if you want to have confidence, you want to know that your systems are, especially in a distributed system, are going to, to be safe to, to, not, to fit. When they do fail, when they do fail, they will fail correctly and they will stay, you know, the, the systems will, there will be a failable process in place, there will be backups, everything will, will be handled appropriately. Because there are, you know, inevitable failures when you have, you know, especially any sort of infrastructure you have. You're, you're probably in multiple zones, perhaps, especially if it's a, a worldwide site. Even even if you're not, you might have you know several se several excuse me servers, several different instances of the services you're using, and you want to make sure that those interact together correctly. Now, there's this idea. I don't know if you guys do this here. But at least in the, the American West, the idea of having a controlled burn uh, of a, an area that is prone to forest fires. So you burn a small portion so that the next time a forest fire comes raging through, it doesn't destroy everything. It just, you know, it, it lightly burns across the top and doesn't just take down your entire system. So uh, chaos testing is sort of like that small controlled burn. The principles of chaos engineering. Define what your normal state is. There's sort of a, you know, the site is up and running and you can get to, you can proceed through, you know, purchase an item and or place an item in your shopping cart and purchase it. That's a normal. And, you know, assume that normal will continue with, if you have a control group, you have an experimental group. Uh, and these, uh, there's a website, it's a principlesofchaos.org. So these are, are uh, paraphrased from that site. So then, you know, once you have once you have your normal and once you you know assume that will continue, introduce chaos. You know, some servers might crash, some network connections might be severed, hard drives malfunction. You know, some sort of simulate uh, real world things that might actually happen, and then look to see what the difference was. See if there were, you know, in your uh, control group, your experimental group, see what the differences were, see if the a hard drive that malfunctioned actually had an effect, and if that was okay, you know, was, was there a noticeable effect, was it handled correctly, did, uh, was somebody trying to, you know, purchase something at that exact moment, and did, you know, that end up cascading down and failing the entire site, or did that person have a timeout and maybe needed to refresh the page? Also not ideal. Or did the service just fail over correctly and that person had to wait an extra 20 seconds? Which is okay. Uh, you know, figure out what those differences are and hopefully how to make them better. So going a little bit further, you know, start by building a hypothesis around you know, your normal behavior. Think about uh, systems throughput, think about error rates. It doesn't have to be just the things that I mentioned before. But think about, you know, all of the different that things that you need to, to uh, have a responsive, good system. And then, you know, consider consider these real-world events, things that might happen. You know, there might be a malformed response that comes back, maybe you only get half a response from something, and it does it work right? That yeah, quite right. Maybe you have a uh, spike in traffic that your servers can't handle appropriately. Think about these sorts of things. And then run experiments in production. And it is important to, to run in production. The it's very hard to have your, your QA setup be exactly the same in every aspect as production. So it's, it's important to use production so that it's, it's actually an authentic experience of what your customers will see and experience. Now, and then finally, you know, automate these experiences that experiments so they run continuously. It's all fun in, in games to you know, simulate a, a hard drive going down or to turn off the server, 
But if you have a group of 10 people who just do this manually day in and day out, that's really awful. <laughs> for these people, for everyone. It's, you know, automating the experience is, is uh, experiments. Automating the experiments is uh, a very important step. So the benefits, now that I've told you, you know, what chaos engineering is and why this should be interesting, the benefits of actually using chaos engineering are first, I think this one is probably the most important one. When these failures do happen, developers, you guys, you're awake. No, it's not 3 a.m. The website isn't crashing in the middle of the night. You have to get up and bring, you know, wake up, figure out what's going on, and fix it. It's 10 a.m. You've sat down at your desk, you have your coffee, you know, you're, you're ready and there and can handle something. Part of your normal workday flow. You also start once once the system starts start to, to fail, you start realizing this and designing for failure up front. So it's it starts, you know, thinking about, you know, when you have a large-scale system, what what things will possibly go wrong, and starting to, to think about, you know, well, there was another team that, you know, had this instance, and they probably should have set these four check boxes in advance. Hey, maybe we should do that too, and we won't have these issues. We won't, you know, when when chaos happens to to our team, we'll have, you know, thought about these things in advance and gotten them sorted out. We'll also end up with healthier systems, plus adorable teddy bears. Um, but it's you know the, the more the more systems that you test, the more the more your, your systems you know you'll fix these little things that you find along the way. You'll figure out what what best practices are to to make your system you know stay up and running and be be good. In addition to designing for failure. Developers can, can get a little competitive of that sometimes. So I've seen I've seen some teams where you start to, you know, in addition to, to just designing, you start to really think about it and think, what can I do so that when chaos comes around, you know, how, how can I best this? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make my my services be the most resilient in the whole company and nobody's ever gonna you know, nothing is gonna go wrong when they come down and you know, if, if we have 10 instances, chaos can stop all 10 and you know, it'll be fine in three minutes. We'll just restart and it'll be instant. And it's, it's fun to see this, that there's a, that you want to develop something that you're proud of. And so, you know, if all of these things start to sort of work together and the system as a whole starts to be much, much better, more resilient. One of the issues that we've had is 
is convincing developers that this is really a good idea. And so starting very slowly and taking you know, baby steps into you know, setting this all up. So cutting, this, cut, cutting off and, and taking down an entire service was, was not a good idea. That's, we couldn't uh, work with that on with WASMLG. WASMLG. We also, um, we wanted to be able to use some of our in-house architecture. Like I mentioned, we, we do use that sharp, and I spoke about that yesterday. So um, we wanted to, to be able to automate the chaos testing using our F sharp and some of the, the libraries that we've already written. And we couldn't do that very easily at all with class one B. So how is Jet different? You know, what are we doing differently than one Netflix and you know, the, the other available options out there? Well, I made the big point about how it's very important to be testing in prod and you have to do everything in prod. And we're not actually testing in prod yet. Uh, I mentioned it's been uh, a bit of a struggle to get the, the developers to properly embrace chaos testing and realize all of the benefits that this really brings. And one of the ways where we're sort of slowly warming folks up to that is by only testing in QA. And so we have found uh, you know, a few different things, and I'll talk about those yeah. next, actually. Um, but you know, the the main way, you know, we've, we've tried to be very slow about uh, introducing this concept, especially since one of the really cool things, I watched a talk from QCon a couple years ago, I believe, by Cole Buchandris. And uh, he went very slowly through and gave this great demo of some of the, the fine-tuned controls that Netflix has. And you can run the chaos tests on only your account as a developer, and so you can see exactly what, what effect this will have, you know, just for you. You know, we don't have that sort of fine-tuned control just yet. Um, and I think having something like that would help tremendously into moving those things into production. Now, but a couple of the things that we've had are, we also, in addition, have, uh, we've been able to automate uh, SQL restarts and our geo-replication. So, you know, to set a, you know, we have a checklist source DB for write app jets. We rename the database to the destination server and create the geo replication. Uh, similarly, for stopping it, um, the setting the, the source DB is read only, make sure that we don't have, excuse me, we don't end up corrupting our data. So, it's, you know, a, a quick, easy, a easy automation uh, thing that I know. Uh, a couple other folks aren't aren't doing, but you know, having created the chaos to begin with, the, the infrastructure that we have around chaos made the restarting and the geo replication a lot easier to bring in and and to have set up. We are also, as I mentioned, using Azure and F Sharp, and that outside of, of WasMonkey, almost no one else is really using Azure to to do chaos testing. And as far as I know, nobody is. Using F sharp for chaos testing. And, and having these two really, you know, that's, that's an interesting story for the .NET developers. So I spoke a little bit about why F sharp yesterday, and I have totally different slides today for why F sharp, I promise. Except for like one. So <laughs> mostly. So first this, I love this little graphic. Um, my, my co-worker wrote up a post on the chaos testing that we're doing in JET. And this is the graphic that she uh, had the, the graphics folk develop for it. But, uh, so while this is our little JET chaos monkey, what I really wanted to talk about during the slide was, you know, why JET actually chose that sharply, like what the, the reasoning was, what the, the story there. And our CTO had uh, attended a conference years ago, 2012, I believe. And there was this notion that F Sharp is good for finance and for math sort of things. And he knew that he was going to build this, this e-commerce website and they were going to have this very important pricing engine. He thought, well, pricing is financial stuff and mathy, and so you know we'll definitely build the pricing engine in F Sharp. And as we uh, I, I, you know as he hired the first couple developers and started to to build out the website, they they started to realize that a lot of that they you know they they were having a lot of conversations about where what should really be F sharp and what should be C sharp and how much 
you know, where those boundaries really should lie. And they realized that even the C sharp they were writing was very functionally styled at code. But, you know, they still, they were going with pens. So they ended up creating two completely separate solutions, an F sharp solution and, solution and a C sharp solution, and seeing just where this went. The F sharp one, obviously. The main reason was that we had a lot of uh, the standard cross-cutting concerns, validation, logging, things like that. A really common way to do this you know, in Web API and in such is by adding an attribute onto the, the front of your uh, function. And we needed a way to do this that, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for services that, you know, not just over HTTP, we needed, you know, a very generic way of handling these sorts of things. And there just isn't an easy way to do that in C Sharp. The, the way we had, we had developed in F Sharp was basically uh, using composition and just, you know, flowing through one thing to another called piping. You guys have done any, uh, Unix programming, shell scripting, or even PowerShell in C Sharp. It's the same pipe. It takes the output of the previous function, pipes it in as input to the, the following function. And we were able to, to pipe several things in a row and just handle, you know, in introducing validation or introducing logging as just an extra step in the pipe chain. And it was so much more clear and so much more obvious that that was you know, one of the major factors that switched this over permanently to be an F sharp shop. So, Simon, uh, yesterday I had Jan's book. Today I have Simon Cousins, who did a very similar thing. He yeah, you know, had a very standard business application, tons of updates, constant maintenance, uh, endless new features, two week sprints. And then he discovered that sharp and thought, this is really going to change some of the, the problems I've been having. He and two or three of the engineers went off sort of into a corner and rewrote the application. And came back and delivered it over to the business team and never heard back. He went to them a few weeks later and was like, so uh, is it usable? Is it, you know, it, is it completely broken? Did this not meet your needs? What's, what's happening? I need feedback. And they actually told him that it was perfect. It had all of the features that they requested. It had no bugs. They hadn't been able to find anything that was wrong yet. And they hadn't gotten back to him because they just didn't need anything else. And he originally wrote this, I think, about a month after that conversation. It's now been three years. And he still has you know, no feedback. The, the site is just out there. It's working. Everything performs exactly as expected. It's like Erlang, almost. It just is out there working. So, and then for you folks who were here yesterday, you did see this slide, but discriminated unions are still a very important feature, and I also need them for the folks who didn't see this slide to be able to understand that code. So, in C Sharp or Java, uh, you know, many things like you have a very standard object hierarchy, the transportation, a car, and a bus, and a bicycle, they will kind of carry from that. Over here, in the F Sharp, you know, this would be four separate files. For here, we have four separate lines of code that contain basically the exact same information. The transport, the car, bus, and bicycle that all inherit from that. Um, so it's, it is basically actually the same information. In fact, the C Sharp still has a private set, so it's not properly immutable, whereas F Sharp is immutable by default, the entire language. Um, the C Sharp also lacks structural equality. So there's slightly more going on, but this feature is just called a discriminated union. Basically, you can take uh, a couple different types. There's a car, which is a, a tuple of a make and a model, a bus, which just has a single integer, and a bicycle, uh, which basically doesn't contain any extra information. And, you know, keep them together as a union of those three things as a type of transport. So it's also, again, very easy to pattern match on, which is very much uh, similar to a switch case statement, at least in C-sharp. Um, in that chart, there's all these different ways of modeling that, you know, how you can interact with that data. Whereas in C-sharp and, you know, non-functional languages, you just have the top one if you need it to, to match on that. And again, this is what that matching statement would look like. Matching is a huge part of, you know, especially working with discriminated unions, but even in general working with that chart. 
So you know, we have a get there via, uh, we change in a transport, you have a match transport with, if it's a car, do something special, if it's a bus, do something special, if it's a bicycle. If you go in and later, you know, add an extra overload of train that takes, you know, into Drupal a line, yeah. the next time you compile, it'll tell you, it'll give you warnings everywhere that you forgot to update your match statement. So it's just one extra check, and this has a lot of these, this, you know, a few checks on, you know, the making sure the code that you're writing is, is correct. There's also a units of measure feature. I don't know if anyone uh, remembers or knew about this, but the Mars Climate Orbiter uh, was supposed to, supposed to take all sorts of beautiful pictures of Mars. The day it was trying to land on Mars, completely crashed, blew up, you know, everything, millions of dollars and, you know, several years of work just completely gone because two of the teams that were working on this forgot to communicate with each other. One was using metric units, one was using English units. So their math didn't add up correctly. Oops. Uh, but XSharp has a feature. Basically, you can tag any, any numeric set of information with an additional tag, basically to say what that is. But it doesn't have to be scientific. The, one of the teams that programs the warehouse information, uh, or the, you know, works with a lot of warehouse code, and double checks the, you know, the products coming in and the products leaving the warehouse to see if one is, you know, a unit versus a pallet versus a case of that item, make sure we're sending out the correct amount. Yeah, we did have a bug very, very early on before we opened the site to the public, and there was just like 12 of us sitting around and ordering things where, you know, somebody ordered a four pack of tissues and got an entire case of four packs of tissues. They brought them into the office and they're like, here, everyone, tissues, have tissues, please. Uh, tag providers are also one of my very favorite features of SHARP, another thing that we use quite a bit of. Um, for those folks who work with C Sharp, you may have heard of Entity Framework. Uh, it's basically an ORM, will connect out to your database and it's set up all of the, the connections and everything for you. And I am not making fun of Julie Lerman's work here. Julie is a very good friend of mine. The book is 920 pages because Entity Framework is just that complicated. There's, there's so many different things you need to do and so many ways to, to get it wrong that you know, it needs 920 pages. Whereas you know, setting up a tag provider and getting it to work, it's really these two lines up here. The rest are sort of interacting with it, running a query. Uh, this section here is running a query. This section here is uh, writing an extra uh, line of data back into the database. But you know, 31 lines of code, and this one is interacting with a SQL Server. But tag providers don't have to. There is one for the World Bank. All of the information available to have on the World Bank. There's one for JSON. One for XML. One for CSV. Um, this, there's many, many different tag providers. Anything with a schema that, that, you know, data source, but any sort of schema can have a tag provider written for it. And then, you know, quick, uh, F-Sharp in general tends to be less complex. So, TickSpec, I believe, does uh, BDD testing. But it's just a, a project, you can check it out on GitHub. Um, you can, this is gonna be fun. Uh, so you know this little code here, you can follow what you can see the little you can see of the arrows. There's little darker spots here or arrows. Uh, you know, this bit of code depends on this bit of code, depends on this bit of code. Sort of follow it around. And from what you can see, sorry, it's not super clear. Uh, it is very easy to see what's uh, what the dependencies are in that project. Ha! This is great. Um, so yeah, this one is clearly more complex because you can't see anything. <laughs> Uh, uh, but here you can see some few lines here, but I promise you that this one is even tremendously more complex. You guys especially want to see the graphs, you can, you can sort of see them on my, my laptop. Uh, but just to, to make fun of it, any framework a little bit more. The, the C sharp introduces a lot of unnecessary and usually accidental complexity. So now that we have you know the, the bits and pieces of F sharp that we need to look at the code that we've written for chaos. Let's go right to that. So, our code first, um, you know, the, the first important thing is to select a random instance. So, you know, what, what service, what 
what instance of that service are we going to restart. The uh, compute is a compute management client, which is an Azure thing uh, that's necessary to, to figure out which, which VM we're actually working with. Uh, oh, also, there's, there used to be a bunch of extra logging and double checking things now. Like, here, here, just before I grab one of these, I also double check and, and log if there's only one instance. Uh, if there is only one instance of a service, we'll still restart it. So, but then we'll log that to say there was only one instance, and the developer who has only one instance really needs to look at that because, uh, you know, we will take, you know, if that one instance goes down, obviously that's much worse than if you have three instances and one of them goes down. So, the you know, select rated instance is the, the name of the function. Compute and hosted services, compute and hosted service are the, the parameters here. We have all of this in an async block. You know, first, we have to get hosted service details. We send in a few extra per, uh, parameters. We need to get the deployment information. And then you know, we use that to grab a list of the role instances, uh, put those in an array, and do a random pick, which is exactly what it sounds like. I wasn't going to show you guys that code. But just, excuse me, we'll randomly choose one of these instances. And then it'll return the service name, uh, the deployment information, and that actual instance. So it's that, and, you know, selecting a random instance is a, a pretty easy thing. And then, when we want to restart a random instance. So the, the first thing we need to do is select that random instance. So we have you know, the, the service name, the deployment ID, the role instance information that come out of this function. Then here we're doing our pattern matching. This one is a very easy pattern matching. So the power state, if it's stopped, then we just block that. Like, okay, we're, it's already stopped. We're not going to try to restart it. That seems silly. Um, and you know, use that information. Otherwise, Restart the entire instance, and if there's an error, then log that information for some reason. Now, I told you guys about uh, piping. Piping is, you know, this is a, a chain of pipes here. It's that. So F sharp, in addition to the actual pipe, the greater than symbol goes together are, are how you pipe in F sharp. Uh, but it is very, very important. And in fact, a year or so ago, Two maybe uh, the F# community redesigned their logo and took the piping symbol as, as inspiration. But so what we're taking is that compute uh, Azure compute client information. We're getting all of the hosted services. We do have an ignore list. So if you're really nice and ask the chaos team very nicely, they can put you on a, an ignore list for the day. You know, maybe you have an error that you're trying to work on specifically, you're trying to get a push out to production, then you can get a break and not have your services restarted just that day. Um, so, you know, we, we filter out the, the services that we're supposed to be ignoring. Then we do a new shuffle, which is just another way of, you know, resorting them and shuffling them around to uh, randomly set these up. Then we get a distinct service name. And then, you know, we did the seek map. We, uh, you know, for each of the hosted services, we restart one random instance of those. The async parallel ignore is something that uh, we created by ourselves. It doesn't keep track of, you know, the, the information coming back. So that's what the ignore part is. It also, <coughs> excuse me. Now, this one, it handles like how, how parallel you want this to be. Yeah. And it'll start each of the uh, each of the computations on the actual calling thread to, to keep it a little uh, a little faster. But you know, so we we use no parallelization and then just follow async run synchronously. So here is the sort of the heart, the the important part of our, our chaos code. You can see it's very, I want to say simple, but it's, you know, there isn't much to it there. It's just a few lines of code. Uh, I mentioned that we do have several microservices. This is in the heart of one of those microservices. This basically is the code for one of our microservices. So we just, we have this, you know, setting out. It's, at this point, it's, it's completely automated. The microservice just, you know, runs. Uh, a few separate times between, it, it goes from uh, 9 a.m. to 
I think 4 p.m. we cut it off a little early so that, you know, if something breaks at 4.55 p.m., people don't need to stay in the office all night. But, you know, it's, there's, it is fully automated and we'll just keep breaking things. <laughs> um, so, has this helped us? Has there, you know, have there been, you know, instances where we've really found important bugs? And, of course, definitely. Uh, so we, uh, there was one day, uh, we had the, the manual tester going through. We have a whole manual department to make sure that the things are really properly working. They, they noticed that searching wasn't resulting in data. It wasn't, it wasn't quite right. Um, the pricing team started to see timeouts. And, you know, the search realized that the, you know, pricing wasn't handling those timeouts. They started to properly cascade. Um, there were operations canceled, in exceptions. We found out that Elasticsearch ended up being completely down. Uh, and, you know, the, going from pricing back to search, back to pricing, there had been just this cascade of issues that was blowing, just completely blowing everything up. Uh, it, the, the original fault of this was Chaos had tried to restart Elasticsearch and the, the back and forth of these errors had completely brought the site down. Just from restarting one Elasticsearch instance. Yeah. But it's, you know, we, we realized, you know, we were able to, to learn from that. Again, it was just in QA. But we were able to learn from that and realize that, you know, we didn't have proper failover in, in process. It's the, it shouldn't have thrown these, you know, it shouldn't have cascaded back and forth to have all these errors. We, we should have been able to, um, you know, move the traffic onto a, a different instance of Elasticsearch much faster. Yeah. And, you know, there was only, there was also only one instance of Elasticsearch. It wasn't a, you know, several instances. So we have a proper cluster now. Yeah. So that was the, the major time, the, the big, big uh, bug. It took, you know, three or four days for, for our DevOps team to really sort everything out and bring QA up back into a completely stable state. And then a few other small things. We had an issue with Redis. Chaos team restarted the, uh, our Redis, and we hadn't enabled DNS properly. So, you know, this is, this is important for the Redis cluster so that it supports automatic failover. And, you know, we, we had automatic failover set up. We just hadn't enabled DNS, so it didn't work. And it's little things like this that you find when you know you you think your systems are properly in place, you think everything is going to work, and you forgot one small piece of it because you never tested it. Now, the second thing, we our checkpointing setup, we we had updated the, the checkpointing to a slightly new system, and had never updated the failover for checkpointing to handle this new system. So there have been yeah. There have been a few very important things that we have found from the chaos testing that have made it up into production that you know, we're, we're very grateful for. And in addition, you know, back to the beginning, it, you know, this, this hasn't happened as far as I know on, on Jet, but finding something like this, you know, and not being able to load the CSS would, you know, if that fails, that's easily something that we could track down and find with the chaos testing. So basically, if availability matters, you should be testing for it. That is something that, that is important. And I suppose, in conclusion, Azure and Azure and Chaos is happy. <laughs> it's hard. Um, and you know, it can help you, the Chaos Engineering obviously can help you figure out all of these issues before your customers find them out for you. So if you have any questions, anyone? Yeah. I was curious about uh, what you showed us. <laughs> I was uh, curious about the, the code you showed, uh, showed us a little oh. bit before. Um, it's like uh, our code. Yes, uh, our code. You want to see the... Yeah, I do. I'm just curious because I, I, saw, I saw that your... Uh, what yeah. does it do? Uh, I think about the parallel in your one and uh, run synchronously. The parallel NOR one, the, uh, it's it basically. Okay. Uh, that? No, 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 no. 
Sorry. Okay, so it's the parallel of norm one. It, so there is a, an async parallel, and that will normally just take the, the async block and parallelize it. The ignore will ignore the results. So if, if anything comes back, uh, so the, the parallel of norm one is something that we specifically created in house engine. Uh, but the ignore will ignore the results that come back. The one is is how many like how many times you want to parallelize it, and so sometimes it's one, sometimes it's ten. It's um, it doesn't matter, but it also especially adds the the extra performance step. Uh, yeah, it, it starts using computations on its own calling thread, so it it goes a little faster specifically rather than just parallelizing it but keeping it. And then the run synchronously uh, does run each of the things that the entire set up the async block synchronously, but that's sort of the starting point of, you know, now go off and do. Yeah, but, but what's the point to, to run it uh, synchronously? Uh, I mean, uh, you, you have a synchronous block, so aren't they, then, uh, aren't they self-contained at home? Do you need the uh, synchronous? Yes and no. Um, after you parallelize it, then it takes all of those at once and starts to run them. So they are still, uh, it, it, it will block at that point until uh, until they're, they're finished. But it's also the end of the code, like it's the, the last thing you're doing. So that's that's an okay place to be synchronous or to call an async block synchronously. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, thank you guys very much. It was lovely. Thank you. 